Hey everyone, welcome to another Clean Machine Live. I'm Jeff Palmer, CEO and founder of Clean Machine, a plant-based fitness nutrition company. This video is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Today's topic are blood tests accurate. Now, why would I wanna talk about blood tests for our Vanga 3s? Well, because it's crucial to the validation that a plant pure diet is one of the healthiest diets for human beings. I've been vegan, plant pure for 39 years. And in that time, I have never taken a preformed EPA or DHA, either from animals, obviously, or from algae as a supplement. So what is preformed EPA and DHA and why are everybody so big on those omega-3s compared to the other ones? All right. So why is this such an important part of this? Because if it is true, like some people and some researchers are suggesting that our body uh, needs to get sufficient preformed, that means made outside of the body, not made by the body, because we can consume ALA. Let me go ahead and put up this chart here. So we consume ALA right here at the top, and then it converts down in our body to SDA, then ETA, then EPA here, and then DPA, and then DHA at the very bottom. Okay, so that is a what they call a unidirectional conversion. And we know this by the research showing that it only converts in one way. Now, the big deal about this was that ALA, which is really abundant in the plant, it's in nuts, it's in fruits, it's in dark greens, it's in seeds and beans. There's ALA in pretty much most of the foods that we're consuming. So we're getting an abundant source on a plant-based diet. Now, what happens if you're not getting enough omega-3? Well, that's where the researchers started looking in the bloodstream. They thought, okay, when you consume something, it gets it to your blood, your blood then carries it to the tissues and there's where it's used. So the assumption was like many nutrients that once you eat it, the higher blood levels that you have, the normally regular high blood levels, the normal, your healthy levels will be with omega-3. We now know that that's not the right way to measure uh, omega-3s in the bloodstream. Now, why is that important? Because if it is true that we need external sources of EPA and DHA, plants don't make that except for algae. And algae are not plants, actually. They are algae. They're in the fungi kingdom. So they're not even in the plant kingdom. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with eating fungi. And everybody eats mushrooms or most people eat mushrooms. So it's not a big deal. But it's just not part of our normal land-based uh, dietary things. Mushrooms are accessible to us as sea algae is definitely not accessible to any landlocked uh, human species. So it was never in our diet, not in any significant quantities and not in all populations. So this would be inaccurate, but this would mean that you must eat animal products, which are the only place where you would find preformed EPA and DHA other than algae. And since evolutionary probably didn't have access to that, um, in a regular uh, sustainable quantity, then it wasn't sufficient to supply our diet. Okay, so the big, the big statement, if EPA and DHA is necessary to get preformed or made outside the body, then a plant-based diet is wrong. It's insufficient. It is not good enough to supply the omega-3s that we need for brain health, for joint health, for heart health, for cellular function, for immune function, for so many different things. I don't believe that to be true. I am 39 years vegan, 60 years of age, and in the 39 years, almost four decades, right? Almost four decades. I'm in my 39th year. I've completed 38 years of vegan almost four decades of not consuming a single bit of EPA and DHA in its preformed state. 
I would be dysfunctional all over the place. My joints would be inflamed. My heart would be failing. My brain would be dysfunctioning. Do I seem like I have a dysfunctioning brain to you? <laughs> I don't think so. And after four decades of almost four decades of not consuming EPA and DHA, we now have vegan doctors saying we should be consuming preformed EPA DHA that has never been in our food supply from, from algae, that has never been in a consistent or significant amount in our food supply ever in the human evolution. That's just silly and it's dangerous because you're setting the rest of those naysayers up to say, aha, see, I told you a plant-based diet wasn't healthy for you. You need to take supplements. And it's just not the case. Now, there is the case where we've removed all the B12 from our diet because we wash our foods, we, we sanitize our water, and we don't eat dirt on our food like we used to in nature, just like other herbivorous animals do. So that's the B12. So yes, if you're removing it, like if you're removing sun, sunlight from your daily life, which is where we would normally get vitamin D3, there is a proper place for supplementation, but that's because we've changed um, our lifestyles to remove the B12 and remove the D3 from our regular experience. So yes, we got to replace them through supplementation or go out and get some sunlight and grow and eat your own plants out of the ground and uh, not wash them too thoroughly so that you get uh, um, the uh, B12 producing bacteria and, and enough B12 in unsanitized water. But no, there's a reason we sanitize the water. You don't want to get bacteria that could be harmful to yourself. So I understand the reason for it. Now, back to the EPA, DHA. <laughs> EPA and DHA are made by the human body. So why is there this big concern that you need to get EPA and DHA in a conformed state? So we know through this graph that in our bodies, we take ALA from plants and convert it to stereotonic acid, EPA, ETA, EPA, DPA, and then all the way down to DHA. We, we know that process happens. We've even studied herbivorous animals and, and found that, yes, they convert all the way down the series, whereas carnivorous animals do not. They actually, carnivorous animals, actually start right here at EPA. They've actually lost this. Fish and uh, other carnivorous animals actually just require EPA, DPA, and DHA. That's the only three steps of conversion that they do. All herbivorous animals start at ALA. This is one of the indicators that we know human beings our herbivorous animals is because we have the same conversion rate of ALA all the way down to DHA. But researchers were looking in the bloodstream and they said, wait a minute, in the bloodstream, there's only very little tiny amounts of ALA conversion happening in the blood. So it must not be enough. Okay. Well, it is true. There is very little conversion in the bloodstream because that's not where the conversion is happening. The conversion is happening in the blood. Okay, think of it this way. If you have a bunch of ALA, why would you convert it all the way down to DHA? DHA cannot back convert to any of the other ones. So once it's converted all the way down to DHA, you're done. You're stuck with DHA. That's all you get. Okay, so that doesn't make any sense for the human body to convert something from a dollar bill all the way down to pennies unless you need pennies. You don't do that. And our body wouldn't do that if it doesn't need it. So does the body need it? Well, the body actually stores DHA. So in this study, the first study I'm going to share, um, name of the study. Let's see if I can find it. Okay, let me just talk about the study. All right, so the first study is, is a, a study that said is... Um, ALA sufficient to supply the brain with DHA. So what they did is they said, instead of looking at it in the bloodstream, since there's very little conversion rate going on there, where is that ALA going? So they did a radioisotope tracing. They, they, they attached a little radioactive molecule, just really mildly radioactive, not enough to harm ourselves. And then they followed it in the human body and they found that ALA was being stored in the body in fat tissues and the liver tissues and brain tissues and other tissues in the body. It was being stored and only converted in the tissues when the body needs another form. Now, if you've got six different forms here, you're not going to convert ALA until you need some SDA or EPA or DHA. You'll convert it on an as-needed basis. 
Now this makes total sense so that the body can regulate how much of each different of the six different forms of omega that our body uses for different functions. Okay, this is where it gets interesting. How much DHA is then stored in the body? They found 50 grams of DHA on average is stored in the adult human body. 50 grams. Now that may not seem like a lot, but when you realize that the human brain uses about two milligrams, that's two one thousandth of a gram of one gram, and we have 50, five, zero, 50 grams of stored DHA in our body, and we're only using two tiny milligrams, two and a half to three and a half milligrams per day. We have a huge abundance of DHA, so we don't need to be taking additional DHA already preformed. Our body's already pre-converted that ALA to DHA and is holding it in our body, but it does so in the tissues. You won't see this in the bloodstream. This is why these blood tests are highly inaccurate because that's not where the, the conversion rate is happening. It's happening in the specific tissues. Like the brain will require more DHA than some of the other forms like EPA. EPA, EPA definitely more for use for heart function as we've seen, more of it's actually being stored around the heart. So the question then be, well, they said, okay, well, that's true of blood plasma. Plasma is the whole blood with all the white blood cells, red blood cells and everything in it. But they said, well, let's take a look at the red blood cells and find out how much EPA, DHA, and ALA are inside the red blood cells. Because they thought, oh, well, then we can measure intracellular. So that's when the omega-3 is actually getting into a cell. But once again, what is a red blood cell? Red blood cell carries or transports oxygen nutrients to different tissues and different tissues are gonna need that. Now, once again, if it's all this blood is going to all the different tissues, some may need ALA, some may need EPA, some may need SDA, some may need DHA. Well, you wouldn't wanna pre-convert this if it's a unidirectional and you're locked in to what it converts to once it's converted, you would not want to down convert that and you would want to keep it in its ALA, its top state, because ALA can convert down to all of the other forms of omega-3s. So this makes total sense. Now, here's what's interesting. They found in this study that when you feed, I'll put the study up in the link so you can follow along, along with me. And put it in the comment section. Okay, so, and then I'll put it up on the screen. Okay, so this is the study right here, 2018 study, effects of low and high dietary LA, which is omega-6, and ALA, which is omega-3. These are the two essential fatty acids. Um, ratio uh, compared to PUFAs, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, concentrations in red blood cells, also known as RBCs, red blood cells. Okay, so they looked at this concentration and this is what they found. They, I'm gonna go ahead and put the comment in here because these are direct quotes from the study. So they found specifically a high ALA diet results in increased EPA in the red blood cells and declined DHA concentrations. So if you're on a plant-based diet, you're consuming more ALA naturally because there's more ALA in the green plants that you're eating, the seeds and nuts and the, and the even fruits and vegetables have some ALA in them too as well. So we're consuming on a plant pure diet, we're consuming a lot more ALA. This actually drops out our DHA concentrations in red blood cells. Now, that can be misinterpreted as a negative thing. That means that we're when you the more ALA you take, the lower your red blood cells get in DHA. So why is that? Okay, let's take a look at why our body would kick DHA to the curb from our red blood cells and replace it with ALA. Because here's what they found. And this is again, direct quote from the research. This is what they found. They found, however, and this is a direct quote from the study, 
that the changes effectively balance each other out so that the sum total of EPA and DHA in red blood cells, which is an established marker for healthy protective effects of omega-3, remains constant. So what it's doing is replacing the DHA, is removing the DHA and replacing it with more ALA and EPA. So this is interesting. Why would it do that? Why would our body, our red blood cells actually kick DHA out? Now, this is not seen in those eating a standard American diet, an omnivorous diet, because they're getting lots of DHA. So the DHA is coming and entering into the red blood cells. So this makes it look, if you're looking at the red blood cells, it makes it look like if you're eating preformed animals, fish, but also rest of the animals, even dairy and eggs can have some EPA and DHA. So if you're eating animal products, you're gonna show up with higher DHA in your blood cells. The more ALA you get, the more your body actually kicks out that DHA and replaces it, but keeps the balance, the total sum of ALA and EPA uh, the same. So that's what that study was suggesting. Why is the body, why specifically the red blood cells are doing that? So let's take a look at some of the functionality of red blood cells. Okay, so let's do this study. I'm not going to post the link uh, because it's too long and it'll take up too much space, but I'll provide it later. Okay. So this study is called plant-based omega-3s may boost heart health and reduce risk of heart disease. Now in red blood cells are pulsing through the heart on a constant basis. So it's the pump. It's what makes all the blood go around. So it would make sense that if your body needs higher levels of ALA and EPA to protect the heart, to kick out the DHA because it's not as effective. Well, let's, let's actually see what that study says. And this is really interesting because it really suggests something quite different. Okay, so when people with low levels of omega-3s ate uh, a diet high in uh, ALA, they saw benefits in the terms of cardiovascular health. So their cardiovascular health improved just because they're getting more ALA in that. That was cool. That was cool enough. But this next sentence is the important part here. But when people with high levels of omega-3s from other sources, aka animal sources, like preformed EPA and DHA. So if you already have a high level of EPA and DHA that you're consuming from animals, but then you added even more ALA from plants from the other sources, when they ate more ALA, they also saw a benefit. It could be that ALA works synergistically or even better or differently than the other preformed omega-3s. So this study is suggesting that you can be on, a, on an omnivore diet, but the more plants you eat, you're gonna get additional benefits from the ALA that you won't and can't get from the EPA and DHA. Even if you already have sufficient levels of EPA and DHA that you're getting from preformed sources like algae or or stuff. So this is showing actually why the blood cells would kick out this EP, DHA, because it's not as effective. It's better to take on the ALA, push the DHA out, and have more ALA in the cell because it's more cardioprotective. Why wouldn't you want more of that in your blood cells and less of the DHA if it's already stored at 50 grams in the body and your brain is only using two milligrams? You don't need that DHA, so it kicks it out because ALA is superior to DHA. That's why your blood levels go down when there's more ALA present. So this is really interesting because one of the plant-based doctors, one of the very popular plant-based doctors actually did this, did this. He went and consumed ALA and his DHA levels down. He consumed even more ALA and his DHA levels went way down because it's being replaced by something that's better. It's better than DHA. That's why. But this is where we've got it all wrong. We assume that just if you're taking high amounts of ALA, what you would naturally do just by eating plants, 
that you're that based on the blood cells that you're not getting enough DHA, which is not true. Your body's kicking out a less or an inferior form of omega-3s, DHA, and replacing it with a superior form. So your ALA levels go up. Your EPA levels can either go up or, or, or remain the same. And those DHA levels drop because you don't need them. They're not as effective. Okay, that's just one study. And you can say, Jeff, that's just one study. All right, well, let's look at another study. Okay, this study is the impact of ALA the vegetable uh, omega-3 fatty acid on cardiovascular disease and cognition. So the role of ALA in cognition is in its early stages, but shows promising evidence counteracting cognitive impairment. So ALA is actually beneficial for the brain. <laughs> well, all right, well, let's look at more of what it does for the brain, not just cardiovascular disease. We're talking ALA here. All right, it's a little bit le more lengthy. I should have put the study up separately, but determinants of fluid intelligence and healthy aging omega-3 uh, PUFA acid status and, and looking at it in the brain. So this quote, the mediation analysis revealed that one pattern of omega-3 uh, fatty acids consisting of ALA, SDA, and ETA. Now I'm going to pull up the the uh, thing here, and I'll show you. So right at the top here, ALA, SDA, and ETA. So these are the first three. This is what ALA converts highest into. If you take EPA, it can only convert down to DHA. So you're only getting three when you consume EPA, EPA, DPA, and DHA. And when you consume DHA, all you're getting is DHA. It doesn't convert to anything else. It stays at DHA. So if you are consuming EPA and DHA from animal products, these two, you're not getting any of these top three. Now, are they important? And this is what this study becomes so important. This study showed that consuming this ALA, SDA, and ETA was linked to fluid intelligence. I'm sorry, let me take the chat. Uh, okay was linked to fluid intelligence and total gray brain matter volume. It protects and preserves the amount of brain matter in your head. Now, I don't know about you, but I like having more gray, gray brain matter in my head and higher fluid intelligence. But this was done on ALA, SDA, and ETA, not EPA, not DHA. So this shows this has a possible superior effect for brain health than DHA. So why all this thing about DHA? It's because it bioaccumulates in the brain because the brain needs it on a regular basis. So it'll store up in the brain, fatty parts of the brain. Brains, if anybody calls you a fat head, just give them a thumbs up because you, you actually do have a lot of fat in your head. That fat is a storage container for omega-3 fatty acids to make sure you don't ever run out. Because in our diet, sometimes we'll have too little, sometimes we'll have too much. It'll fluctuate with our diet, especially in cold winter months. We can go months without it. That's why our body is storing so much of the DHA uh, in, after it's been converted from ALA into our bodies. Okay, so we now see that better brain function, better heart function with ALA, not EPA or DHA. So this is really important, but it goes on. So this study, let's look at diabetes. So we see superior heart function, cardiovascular risk disease go down with ALA, not EPA or DHA. We saw brain function improve, with ALA, SDA, and ETA, the top three, not EPA or DHA. Now let's look at diabetes. So this looked at 43,000 Chinese, um, adult Chinese, and looked at their fatty acid. And the plant-derived ALA cut the risk for type 2 diabetes by 21%. 
nothing was found to be protective in type 2 diabetes by consuming fish or marine omega-3s. No benefit whatsoever. This is really important. We're seeing this over and over that the plant-based ALA is superior to fish oil. It reduces cardiovascular disease, it improves brain function, it decreases the risk of heart disease. Were you not seeing this in the preformed EPA and DHA? Because our body can make its own. So this is really important. So what I want to do is leave you with this question. Why are we measuring omega-3s in the blood? We need to come up with a better way to measure. The best way to measure it is to measure it in actual tissues, but we can't go around taking chunks of people's brains out and chunks of people's heart out to measure how much omega-3 in it. We need to come up with a better way to do it. Blood tests are not it. The blood plasma has been proven to be wrong. Um, the omega-3s can be removed from the blood system within short periods of time. So that's not accurate. We now know that the more you can uh, consume ALA, the more it kicks out DHA and is not an indicator of how much DHA you actually have in your body. So that is not accurate either. So the big question then is, I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen. Is the lowering of DHA in red blood cells being caused by replaced by e ALA and EPA, both of which are found to be more anti-inflammatory and more cardioprotective than DHA? I'm going to go ahead and show you one more study that illustrates that. So this study, so this is the ratio of EPA to DHA. So they found that the ratio of D, uh, EPA to DHA, uh, they were trying to figure out what's the best ratio. How much is it two to one EPA to DHA? Or is it, should it be two to two or one to one equal amounts of EPA to DHA? Well, that they found out it matters if you're male or female. It matters if you're sedentary or active. It matters if you're black or white. It matters if you're lots of different things. If you're overweight, if you have diabetes, if you have blood, blood pressure. So one thing that they found is that a higher EPA to DHA ratio saw a greater reduction in C-reactive protein, meaning it reduced inflammation better. So this is really important. And this next study is going to expound on that and show us why that's so important. So EPA and D DHA differently modulate monocyte inflammatory response. So different amounts. This is why the body has this amazing regulatory system. This is why our body turns on and off these different enzymes that regulate how much this is uh, converted and when. So you don't want this converting in the bloodstream because the body doesn't know if it needs more of EPA or DHA to do that balance. Okay, so from the study, you can see it right here. DHA also reduced levels of anti-inflammatory protein, whereas EPA did not. Now, this specifically tells us why it's not good to have more, uh, it's good to have more EPA than DHA in the blood vessels, in the blood, red blood cells, because EPA is more anti-inflammatory and more cardioprotective than DHA. That's why it would kick that out of that or use that for some other purpose or store that DHA and get rid of it. And that's why the red blood cells were increasing in ALA and EPA and decreasing in DHA. So we were getting the exact wrong message that that's exactly what red blood cells should do when they have a preferred source of omega-3s is that the body is actually doing the right thing by reducing the amount of DHA when it has a superior ALA effect uh, available. 
So the more you eat plants, the better cardio protective. Now we know that's true across multiple studies. The more you eat plants, the more cardio protective it is, the more brain health and less disease, brain disease effects we have. We see this over and over again, and that's the effects of the ALA and the EPA and the other two metabolites, SDA and ETA. So you get those top four from eating ALA, which are more beneficiary, and then we're storing a whole ton of uh, DHA, so it's the least needed. That's why it's at the very bottom of the conversion rate. If it was that important, our body would put it at the top. If it's that important, plants would make it for us, and they do, which is the ALA. That's why it's at the top of the conversion. Why DHA is so little important is at the bottom. Now, if you take someone who is insufficient, not enough EPA and DHA, which unfortunately is the vast majority of people in the Americas, and you give them a supplement that will help with the inflammation, whether it's EPA, DHA, or ALA, yes, you're going to see some improvement. The question should be, will you see a better improvement if it's mostly ALA than DHA? To be honest, we haven't, <laughs> we haven't enough research to, 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 to do that. And even the researchers in these studies have complained about this, that the amount of research that's available is so small. The, this one review that I just posted earlier in the conversation said there was only three studies on ALA looking at red blood cells, three. But there's hundreds, if not thousands of studies on EPA and DHA. Why? Because we've never looked at it. We have never looked at plants. We've always, you know, plants have been the redheaded stepchild of our diet. We always assumed EPA and DHA, which is abundant in animals and animal foods are better. No, they are not. And we need to get this right. We need to put plants back in their proper status as the primary source of nutrition for human beings. And we can start to see some of this come through in the data. These assumptions that we're making, oh, when you eat a lot of ALA, your DHA and red blood cells goes down. I'm like, great. Awesome, it's being replaced with something better. Everybody else out there is going, oh, that's scary. I'm not gonna have enough brain health because I'm eating ALA and plants and my DHA levels are going down in my blood and that's gonna make my brain not work. I have not consumed preformed DHA in almost four decades. Guys, if this were true, if this were accurate, I'd be brain dead by now. <laughs> Come on. I'm very passionate about this. I know it's really a lot of science. I'm hoping there are people out there who get what I'm uh, I'm saying and understand this data in a different way because the foundation, when I see plant-based doctors, I just got off a, a interview from a webinar on um, plant-based omega-3s that was, again, suggesting uh, taking algae. And I'm like, no. You're just mimicking the bad habits of an animal-based diet. Plants have it right all along. And we need to understand that. We need more research to show this, and we need a better understanding based on better assumptions about what those things are doing. A lower amount of DHA in the red blood cell is a good thing, not a bad thing. ALA and EPA are superior at producing anti-inflammation superior of boosting immune, superior at uh, cardiovascular and brain health. This is what we need to look at. We need to change our understandings about what the body is doing and why it is doing it, because it has the wisdom and our body is adapted by eating plants. That is what our whole chemistry is based on. That's why we have this entire conversion chart of ALA all the way down to DHA, like every other herbivore on the planet has, and unlike any uh, carnivore or many omnivores have, which only start at EPA and go down to DHA. They don't even have these first three, whereas we and every other herbivore does. Our body conserves energy. Our body would not go through these steps of work, which uses energy, of creating enzymes, which uses protein, would not create those steps if it wasn't necessary. That's why in carnivores, it's not necessary and they've lost that first three steps altogether. It doesn't even happen 
in their bodies. They cannot convert ALA down to EPA or DHA, which they need because they don't need to, because they're getting it already preformed from animals. But that's only in carnivores. All herbivores need ALA. That's why it is the only essential omegas for human beings and all other herbivores. Look, this is the, the storage process. We consume ALA, it goes into our bloodstream and then it gets circulated. Then it goes into fat tissues, liver tissues, brain tissues, and other tissues, heart tissues, and it gets stored there so that it can be converted on site. It's like, why would you, why would you like, okay, Amazon, Amazon's a good thing, right? They built warehouses all over the country. Why? So they can localize and get quick delivery of that to them. So the body stores it in this preformed state and can convert it down anytime it needs to, to the exact needs and send it locally because it's in the tissues, it's stored in the tissues it would not pre-convert it in the bloodstream. That makes no sense whatsoever. That's like saying uh, Amazon's gonna send everything up into the air and wait till somebody orders it and then fly it back down to the ground. No, God, no, they wouldn't do that. It'd be extraordinarily expensive. They ship it directly to the specific warehouses locally. It's just like our ALA takes it to our specific tissues locally in our body. So convert it in the tissues. That's why this conversion is not showing up in the bloodstream. You would not want to precur change that precursor into a different currency until you needed it. Currencies. You don't convert your dollar bill and, into pesos unless you are in Mexico. So you keep it in your wallet until you get to Mexico, and then you need it there, and then you convert it there. And that's exactly what the body is doing in all its wisdom. It is taking that ALA, holding it in the tissues, and converting it at the tissue, at the locally, quickly, and efficiently, and doing it right on the as-need basis. If our body needs a little bit more EPA because we've got more in inflammation, it'll boost up that level by turning on those enzymes producing more EPA. If it needs more DHA, it's saying, okay, the stores are a little bit low. Let's stock up the stores, 50 grams of stores tons of extra DHA in our body. We don't need to consume it as a supplement. That's why I went out and found the richest source of omega-3 and omega-6 essential fatty acids of any plant in the kingdom to give you the best source so that you can make sure that you're hitting your omega-3 targets every single day nutritionally. Also, I'm, I am so adamant about this information because when we have plant-based doctors arguing that a plant-based diet is insufficient for an essential fatty acid, we've got, we've got problems here. We can't have our own people giving the ammunition to other people to say, oh, that vegan diet is wrong because you can't get enough. You have to take a supplement for it. No. That's the argument they use against us in B12, and we know that's not our accurate because we've removed it from our uh, in natural intake. Same with D3. That, yes, we do need to supplement, but everybody should be supplementing it, um, not just uh, omnivores and, and vegans, both, especially D3, because we're all living indoors. So what's the diff? The big diff is that this needs to be clear that you can get sufficient. Yes, you have to make sure you get enough. Just eating vegan junk food isn't going to get you there. Whole food, plant-based diet, sufficient quantities, nutrient-dense foods, making sure you're getting lots of greens, occasional nuts and seeds to cover that or and or supplementing just to make sure you're getting that for healthy muscle gains, for healthy brain, for healthy heart for healthy skin, for healthy joints is so important. Please, I know this is a lot of deep research and stuff and I'm, I'm surprised that anybody sit, sit here, listen to this whole thing, but um, if you can share this and get this information out, even tagging some of the uh, vegan doctors or vegan professionals out there, nutritionists, um, dietitians, things like this, really want to get this research out there and available to more people so that we can change this conversation that a plant pure diet is the best, healthiest diet and you can maintain and uh, achieve all the nutrients you need through a plant pure diet. Uh, I'll be uh, providing a source of plant uh, micro B12 too as well. 
Yes, bioavailable vitamin B12 in the plant. Stay tuned for more on that. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next week.